My name is Patrick Smith. I have the pleasure of working at the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School. I serve as core faculty and teach here. Uh, we have a very special guest here, Mr. Rasan Hall, who is the director of the Racial Justice Program at the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts. Uh, before joining the ACLU of Massachusetts, Rasan was the deputy director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and Economic Justice. Uh, and before then, he served as the assistant district attorney for the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. Uh, welcome, Rasan. It's good to have you uh, back here once again with us. It's a pleasure to be here, Patrick. Great. Uh, when you first joined us, uh, you joined us as a guest at our screening of the movie The 13th, uh, just before the Behind the Bars conference that we had at the end of uh, 2017. And during that time, the conference was really a striking semblance of how vulnerable people groups uh, have been marginalized by mass imprisonment, um, those who are people of color, those who are economically disadvantaged, uh, the undereducated, and those suffering from mental illness. Um, how do you see all of this connecting with questions of health and health care, right? Some may be a little curious as to how you're thinking, we're thinking about bioethics uh, and some of these other kinds of issues that, that emerge in these spaces. Well, all of those uh, demographic populations that you described, um, people of color, people with mental health issues, uh, people who suffer from substance use disorders, uh, black people, Latino people, poor people who are disproportionately represented uh, in the criminal legal system also come from communities uh, where there are significant health disparities. Uh, but also it's worth noting that people who are system involved, people who have been incarcerated, oftentimes suffer from more uh, strenuous health complexities uh, once they are released. And not only them, but sometimes their families too, whether it is from the lack of adequate health care, health insurance, health coverage, uh, or just the stressors that are a part of uh, the system and the things that they are exposed to within those institutions, uh, but then kind of the lifestyles and challenges that they face uh, once they've been released. So there's a, a very tight correlation uh, between health disparities, health outcomes, and people being involved uh, in the criminal legal system. Excellent. So would you say that there is a uh, kind of a connection between maybe bioethics and what some would consider social ethics as well? Uh, absolutely. The, the, the questions that we are asking ourselves as a society, as uh, parts of institutions about what are the right ways uh, to deal with issues that people are facing, what are the appropriate analyses uh, to bring to some of these issues, uh, are the questions that we should be asking, but they have to be asked within a full context, one that contemplates uh, race and the history of racism in this country and the role of white supremacy, but it also has to contemplate the role of capitalism and other uh, systems that operate in people's lives that lead to an overrepresentation of these particular groups in these systems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of complex issues uh, that you've just identified and named, and I know you do a lot of work at this intersection of uh, policy and legislative advocacy, uh, especially uh, that side of the, the human rights uh, conversations. Uh, what are some of the, um, or what do you see as the potential solutions for uh, some of these problems that you have identified here? Well, there's, there's certainly no panacea. Yeah. Um, I think the more uh, people have access to information, there's a greater likelihood uh, that we can see some change. Uh, but I also feel like um, advocacy on the part of grassroots organizations and uh, the general public is going to really help uh, move the needle. Of course, uh, reducing the rates of incarceration uh, in this country are a, a preeminent issue. I think, you know, Massachusetts, where we are, uh, has uh, one of the lowest, if not the lowest, incarceration rates in the country. Uh, but if Massachusetts were its own nation, we would have the 11th highest uh, incarceration rate. And in addition to that, we have one of the worst racial disparities uh, in, in who we incarcerate. And so when you think about those racial disparities, the significant number of people that are incarcerated, and the connection 
into uh, health disparities and health outcomes, uh, we would be well served to have a criminal justice system or a criminal legal system that is diverting more people away from the system, uh, putting them into treatment, creating more opportunities for people to successfully reintegrate uh, back into society. Because it's not just that individual who has been uh, accused and convicted of a criminal offense, but it is also their family that they are connected to, the children that they are responsible for raising or co-parenting, uh, the uh, uh, intimate partners that they are in relationship with, but also the larger community that they are uh, a part of. So I, I think that is a key uh, solution that could uh, address some of those outcomes. Yeah, very good. Uh, I know that your organization, your chapter at the ACLU, has been doing quite a bit of work on uh, asking the question, what difference does a DA make? Uh, could you talk a little bit about that, how that may factor into uh, this, this bigger picture here? Right. I, I think, you know, one of the in, the, in the midst of this national conversation about criminal law reform, uh, the person or the entity that is the least discussed is the district attorney. Um, a lot of people don't know the role, the power, the influence that district attorneys have. Mm -hmm. Uh, we did some polling early on and found that four in ten Massachusetts voters did not know that the district attorney was an elected official. And so, and again, these are people who identified themselves as voters, not just residents of Massachusetts, but people who go to the polls and cast a ballot every uh, election. And so the their power over charging decisions, bail requests, sentencing recommendations, uh, the relationship with the police, what they do with civil asset forfeiture funds, and most importantly, their influence over the legislature. Uh, these are all roles that district attorneys play, uh, and the general public knows very very little about them. And even if the legislature weren't to pass uh, progressive legislative reforms, there are a lot of things that district attorneys can do that would limit the amount of people that are incarcerated. I think a perfect example is what we've seen uh, in Philadelphia, where Larry Krasner, a uh, former criminal defense and civil rights attorney, was elected district attorney uh, by an overwhelming majority. And he has put in place uh, some sweeping policy uh, reforms that look to change the face of the criminal legal system in the city of Philadelphia. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it's uh, amazing uh, just thinking about that, especially with the grassroots kind of organization. So not only do you need to think about you know, making sure people are registered to vote, but voter education becomes extremely important in, in thinking about these issues and making an impact in the overall health uh, of our uh, communities. Uh, we know that you're a lawyer, uh, you have a Juris Doctorate, but you also have an MDiv. Yeah. Uh, and so this question of religious ethics uh, sometimes comes up in thinking about issues of health and, uh, and how do you deal with some of the social determinants of health and so on and so forth. What role does uh, that part of your background uh, play in helping you think about these issues, uh, either whether it be framing health or uh, addressing health disparities, uh, apart from the policy and the advocacy piece that that's part of your yeah, your I, profession. I, I think for me, you know, uh, uh, personally, uh, it is my moral compass. Uh, it helps me discern what are uh, or what is the appropriate uh, a, a approach to take to issues, who are the appropriate people, and um, from my kind of theological orientation, it is the least of these, right? I, I view, um, you know, a, a God as a God of the oppressed, uh, someone uh, or a being that is on the side of those who are uh, without, those who suffer. And so when I think about uh, that, the application of that to um, my vocation, uh, I see the role as an attorney uh, being one that I am called to serve uh, people who are in need, people who have been uh, put upon by society, by government, and uh, in the work experiences that I have had, uh, I have been led to this place where criminal law reform uh, that disproportionately impacts poor people, people of color, and specifically black people, uh, is an area that is in the greatest need for reform and the greatest uh, uh, space for uh, impactful advocacy. And so, uh, you know, I think that's how I'm, I'm, I'm governed by it. Uh, but I also think uh, the, there are larger truths that come from, um, you know, my own uh, faith, but, uh, but also other religious communities, uh, principles of, of, of faith and the, the ideas of 
um, of, of fairness and, um, and the principles of caring uh, for people. Those are some of the things that should guide people through the work that they're doing. Yeah, yeah. You know, in one of the classes we uh, teach here, you know, we're really wrestling with issues of social justice and concepts of justice and how they may inform the work of bioethics. Uh, and it's fascinating, some of the folks we've read who are religious ethicists, you know, talk about notions and ideas of justice mm -hmm. as uh, not only should we think about justice uh, as states of affairs, but also the, that we should strive to be just persons, mm -hmm. right, uh, who can uh, exercise justice in our interactions and dealings with each other and making sure that notions of justice extend beyond just how we distribute, you know, goods or burdens and benefits, but to yeah. these larger kind of uh, social dynamics that, that kind of govern how we do life together. Mm -hmm. and it sounds uh, quite a bit uh, like what you are describing in terms of how uh, a particular religious ethic may inform the advocacy work uh, that, that you're doing in, in some respects. There. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, and for as much as uh, people profess this to be a Christian nation, um, you know, the ACLU, we were very uh, clear about the separation uh, uh, of church and state, but, but there is still uh, this, this ethos that permeates civil society, uh, that there are uh, bedrock principles to uh, who we believe we are as a nation, that whether or not people embrace it are, are rooted um, in, in religious values um, that are tied to Christianity, but I think also transcend across uh, other uh, uh, belief systems, and so I think to the extent uh, that it, that that is a part of uh, our makeup uh, as a nation, uh, we have an obligation um, to 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 investigate uh, and examine those things and see how they play out uh, for us in in the society. We, you know, many states in the union, some of them are called commonwealths, right? We are the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and so the things that we should that we do should be in furtherance of the uh, the commonwealth. Uh, when you think about the the, um, context of the Center for Bioethics and the kind of folks that we are working with and, and training um, to, to wrestle with these issues that you have uh, described here. What would be some next steps that you would recommend for uh, folks who are working in either healthcare spaces, whether it be nurses, uh, social workers, doctors, right? Mm -hmm. Some may be listening to our conversation here thinking, well, that's you know all well and good. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a legal scholar, I'm not a, a political advocate, uh, so what can I do uh, to help address some of these issues of health, health care, health care disparities, and so on and so forth? What would you say uh, to someone in that situation? Right. Um, so uh, w one of the things that I like to, to tell folks is, one, do the knowledge, right? There is uh, an abundance of information out there. Um, uh, that people can self-educate. Uh, but I think one of the things that is particularly important for people in this space is to understand that uh, racial disparities are a very real thing. Uh, but they, they did not come to exist just by happenstance. Uh, they are an outgrowth of systemic oppression. Um, they are the result of years of uh, disinvestment uh, in communities and overt uh, uh, oppression uh, in certain communities. And, and I think the better able people are to understand the historical context and how it is tied to what they're seeing in the communities and the populations they serve uh, now, it, it, it helps somebody to have a different level of empathy or understanding. Um, and also can help folks begin to identify what might be the things that are uh, the sources of uh, some of the disparities. Um, and so, you know, doing the knowledge and then, you know, kind of getting active uh, beyond just the, the people being in their lane and, and, and doing their job. Uh, but what are the kind of auxiliary groups, whether it is related to your field of practice uh, or if it's completely unrelated to your field of practice, but it raises up an issue that touches on these things. Mm -hmm. For instance, there are, whenever I give speeches uh, or um, public presentations about racial justice or racial disparities in America, um, without fail, there are white people who will come to me and say, well, what should I do and, and, and where should I go uh, for this information? And there are a ton of resources out there that are available online. Uh, but uh, by way of example, there's a group called Surge showing up for racial justice, you know, and so this kind of leads to, you know, my last um, 
you know, suggestion or point, uh, which is get your people, mm -hmm. right? Because there's, uh, there's a certain uh, burden that is placed on the shoulders and backs of the oppressed to help solve the problem of their oppression mm -hmm. when they were never responsible for creating it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to educating oneself and knowing what the issues are and how they connect to uh, the problems and the, and, and the disparities that we see today, but getting involved and engaged with the organizations uh, that are addressing that work, whether it is related to your field uh, of practice or if it is something uh, completely collateral um, and, and is related to just kind of larger social justice movements. And then finally, um, being in the space with the people that you are most like and sharing that information and pushing back on the false narratives uh, that come up to kind of disabuse people of some of the notions about uh, that they have about certain groups of people. Yeah, very good. And, you know, we've discussed a little bit at the conference about this relationship of violence uh, and the trauma that's experienced by that. And many people are pushing and advocating to reframe that as a public health uh, issue. Uh, would you talk a little bit about that in terms of what the benefits of that kind of reframing uh, stuff, kind of, uh, you know, overly criminalizing these, these issues of reframing as a public health issue? What are the benefits uh, of something like that? Sure. Uh, you know, when we talk about, you know, dealing with something as a public health issue, I, I'm reminded of uh, the war on drugs and particularly uh, the war on crack, um, which by many has been viewed as the war on black people, um, because there was uh, a significant uh, influx of federal and state dollars targeted at dealing with the issue of substance abuse in communities of color as a criminal issue, as opposed to the public health issue that it was. People had a sickness, people had a disease, the disease of addiction. People were self-medicating uh, for lack of resources or um, whatever the case may be. And it was dealt with as a criminal issue. Now we look at the opioid crisis in America that is destroying communities and families and tearing apart lives. Um, and to a person, politician, law enforcement officials say, we need to treat this as a public health issue. And what that has meant is that the public health issue um, framing on the opioid crisis means we're looking at new ways of dealing with uh, opioid addiction uh, that are different from the ways that they were dealt with in the past when it related to uh, crack use and heroin in communities of color. That's in my perspe uh, perspective largely in part be be due to who are the victims uh, of opioid, disproportionately so, and it's large numbers of white people in middle class communities. And so now there's this desire to deal with it as a public health issue. And so we see the benefits of trying to find more federal funding to create more treatment beds and to get more education about uh, the dangers of, of opioids. Um, and so when we think about violence in communities of color, certainly there is a criminal aspect to it because laws have been broken, lives have been taken. Um, but when we deal with it as an epidemic or a health crisis, uh, there is a different way to approach understanding why it's happening, what are the potential remedies or solutions to address it, um, and then funding um, the, the, the research to, to understand it and to find other alternatives, to intervene in the lives of the people who are caught up in it, but then also to deal with the people who have been the victims uh, of that violence, um, uh, given the trauma that they faced and are exposed to. Yeah, you know this issue that you're you're getting at here. Uh, there are these notions of uh, kind of restorative justice that many folks, you know, are talking about, uh, and I think myself included. I believe that this is a, a very important way of of thinking about th these questions uh, for those who may not be fully aware of what uh, restorative justice is and how it may you know kind of play out in some of these issues. Um, could you share a little bit about how that? Sure. Um, you know, restorative justice practices have been around for uh, centuries, generations. Uh, it is a practice that is, you know, very well known among Native American or First Nation uh, peoples uh, communities. But essentially, it's a it's it's a, an accountability measure, because you can put someone in prison, 
uh, and that is indeed punishment. And it is also a form of restraint because while they are incarcerated, they are not out committing other crimes. But who is that person when they are released, when there is no programming, there is no treatment, there is no self-reflection or evaluation that prepares them to re-enter society as an effective, functioning, whole human being? And so you have punishment, but you don't have accountability. What the restorative justice process does is holds that person to account within community. And so on a very practical level, what that looks like sometimes is a circle of people uh, that include the offender as well as the person who has been victimized or wronged by the person as and members of the community, the law enforcement officials, but also people who were in, impacted by uh, the particular act. And in addition to uh, the, the offender hearing from the victim or the person who was victimized by them, uh, what the impact of their act has had on their lives, how it may have derailed their lives or how it may have uh, caused great harm and pain and then also what are the ripple effects of that to the larger community, the individual offender is now responsible to explore for themselves what even led them to a place where they would create that type uh, of harm. And so that is the, uh, the process of being accountable. Uh, you know, a lot of people dismiss it by just saying, oh, it's like, it's a hug a thug. Uh, but in reality, we have to look at this system where we are living in a society where so many people, particularly young people, have not been hugged. They have not been hugged by the educational system. They have not been hugged by the employment opportunities in their community. They have not been hugged uh, by the law enforcement that over police their community. And so the person that they end up being is a function of a, a, a neighborhood, a community that has been deprived of resources, over policed, uh, and oppressed in many different ways and are in need of that type of hug for the betterment not just of themselves, but for the larger community. You've given us a lot to think about, uh, and we all collectively have a lot of work to do. Uh, thanks so much uh, for being here and sharing with us uh, in our audience, and uh, we look forward to the next go round. Okay. Wonderful. Thank, well, thank you, you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us uh, today. For those of you who want to explore these issues and topics further, please check out the Harvard Medical School Bioethics Journal. There you can find a number of other essays and video clips that deal with these issues.